Good evening. I'm Steve Setchell, the Paw graduate of the class of 1996. On behalf of my colleagues in the Office of Alumni Engagement, I want to welcome you to DePaw's Virtual Alumni College. This is a new series started last fall, enabling alumni to engage DePaw professors, uh, find opportunities for lifelong learning, and enjoy the kind of discussions that our students find on campus every day. Tonight our speaker is Dr. Sharon Crary, who is the Percy L. Julian Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry. She came to DePaul in 2003 after graduating from Williams College in 1993 and receiving her PhD later from Duke University in 1999. She did postdoctoral work at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, and while at DePaul, she's received grants both from the National Institutes of Health and the Dreyfus Foundation for her research on the Ebola virus. Uh, outside of the classroom and beyond her research, she co-founded and serves as president of a small nonprofit called Social Promise. And Dr. Crary lives here in Greencastle with her husband, who coaches track and field, and her two sons, who are in elementary school. Dr. Curry is speaking tonight on a global health crisis. Dr. Curry, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for coming here tonight in the classroom here. I really appreciate your support. And then also thank you everyone for joining us online. Um, I think it's great to have people who are interested in global health and I hope to convince you that it's something that you should try to get more people interested in. Um, I'd call the talk tonight a global health crisis. And I guess one, the first thing that I might bring to your attention is, is there really a global health crisis? And if there is, how do we know? And to think about whether or not there's a global health crisis, what we really need to think about is what these three different words mean. And so the first word is crisis. And when I think of crisis, I think of something that's really very dangerous. I think of something that everyone who saw the situation would agree that it's very dangerous, that there's an enormous amount of difficulty going on, and that people are going to need to respond to help resolve the crisis, that people are going to need to take action, to make decisions, and that probably this crisis is so enormous that it won't just be one person who can respond, but that a whole bunch of people would need to respond, that we would need multiple people with lots of different backgrounds and many different skill sets coming together to respond to this crisis. So a global health crisis, the other words we need to think about are global and health. So global, we're just going to say it's health problems around the world. And health then. Let's think about how we can define health. So if you look in a dictionary, you'd see that the definition of health is just often put forward as just the absence of illness and the absence of injury. So that actually is kind of something we can get our hands on. It's a simple definition, but it's something we can work with. Because if we have the illness and injury, the absence of illness and injury as a marker of good health, then we can say that if we did have illness and injury, that would be a marker of poor health. So we know that if you have illness and injury, or if you have very severe illness and injury, this could in fact lead to premature death. And death is something we can measure. So we can now think about health, and we can measure health. And the reason we can measure it is life expectancies have been calculated for populations around the world, different countries, different groups, different communities. And so we're able to think about health, not by thinking about when people are healthy, but by thinking about when they're not healthy. So on this plot, you see on the vertical axis, um, life expectancies in years. And on the horizontal axis is time, also in years. And I should say this is from a website by Hans Rosling, which is called gapminder.org. And I really encourage you to later, not right now during the webinar, but later go to gapminder.org and play around with these charts. They're amazing because they are just still charts like what I'm showing you here. All these little dots, you can actually see them in motion. You can see time going by and watch trends occurring. So if you look here at life expectancy versus time, you see that all on the far right of your screen, all of those circles there are all different countries in the world. And these are life expectancies for all those countries in 2012. And it, I chose three countries for us to highlight the changes in life expectancy over time. I chose the United States because I think most of us in this room have some personal interest in the United States. And then I chose Japan because Japan actually currently has the highest life expectancy in the world. And I chose Sierra Leone because it has the lowest life expectancy in the world. And so you can see the trajectory of life expectancy over time on this slide. 
And in fact, we see that life expectancies are going up over time. So actually, it seems like health is great. Maybe there's no crisis at all. Everything's good, right? But then if we look a little bit more closely, we can see that there's a huge disparity here. If we look even just in 2012, all the way on the right of your screen, you'll see that there's a huge disparity in life expectancies in all these different countries. And in fact, in Sierra Leone, the life expectancy in 2012 was lower than it was in the United States in 1900. So that's a huge difference. So is that a crisis? Maybe it's not a crisis. But maybe to the people living in Sierra Leone, it's not so great. To the people who are raising children in Sierra Leone, it's a problem. To people who are literally middle-aged when they're 23 years old, it's a problem. But let's say for now we're not going to say that that makes it a crisis. Instead, we're going to say, look at these great trends of health going up and up over time. That's wonderful. So is life expectancy enough? Are we happy to just say, trends are going up, we're just going to look at life expectancy, and we're going to say that we're going to judge health only by life expectancy. How do you know when you're healthy? Is it just because you're alive? Probably you ask for a little bit more than that from life. You also maybe want to be able to walk around. Maybe you want to be able to use at least some of your senses. You want to be free from pain. You want to be able to eat nutritious things and to be able to sleep, to feel good, to interact with other people. In fact, we're not the only people who have this kind of consensus about what life, what good health is. The World Health Organization, WHO, in 1948, defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So we can't just look for the absence of infirmity or disease. We have to look for this holistic thing about health. So if we're going to think about health as this big holistic thing and wonder if there's a global health crisis when we're thinking about this large holistic health idea, um, it can be pretty challenging. So to start talking about that, I'm going to tell you a little story. Some of you have heard this before. I know some people joining us online were students of mine who have heard a little bit of this. Hopefully you'll hear something a little bit different tonight. Um, in 2000, I worked at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, and I worked in the Special Pathogens Branch and I worked on Ebola virus. And I'm just a research scientist. I'm very, very happy just working in the lab. It looks weird, but I was happy. Um, I just work, I pet, I do my work, and it's great. And then there was an outbreak of Ebola virus in Uganda, and I was a research scientist who worked with Ebola, so I knew how to diagnose Ebola virus. So I was asked if I could help respond to the Ebola outbreak, and kind of the second round of people who were sent there. So I went there. But first, I got out maps of the world and tried to figure out where Uganda was. <laughs> And it turns out it's in Africa. And although the map has actually changed quite a bit since 2000, the place where Uganda is has not changed. So the way I describe it to people usually is I say, like, if Africa had a belt on, Uganda is right around where its belt would be. But it's over on the eastern side. So that's where Uganda is. So I flew to Uganda. And then I traveled from Kampala all the way up north towards what's now South Sudan to this town called Gulu. And in Gulu, I was stationed at a hospital called Lachore Hospital. And Lachore Hospital, I was there because it had one of the two places that was doing isolation for Ebola virus. And I spent um, about a month and a half at Lachore Hospital. I was there during the winter. Um, and so I spent Christmas time there and New Year's Eve there, New Year's Day there. And it really changed me a lot. Um, I found that I learned about things in ways that I had never known about them. I had a liberal arts background. I read a lot of books. I watched a lot of good films. I paid attention to what people said to me. But I felt like being there in person really made me understand things in a whole new way. And here are some of the things that I learned. I learned that in northern Uganda, people were living in extreme poverty. And I learned that extreme poverty means that on any given day, they're just as likely to die as they are to live. And I learned that infectious diseases that I can just go get like a simple, cheap antibiotic for could actually kill them. And I learned that um, I went to go visit a child in a hut one day. And this sweet little girl brought me there, and I'm all happy to go visit her family. And then I go inside this hut, and I, I learned I was scared. I learned that I was scared that I was going to get tuberculosis by sitting there talking to her grandmother, who was coughing. And I didn't. 
Um, I also learned later that that girl, who was so sweet and had like the purest smile, who was so great, was dying of HIV. And I also learned that kids there can end up paralyzed for life and in wheelchairs um, from a fever or from a landmine, from stepping on a landmine, or actually just from stepping on a piece of glass and getting an infection that just never gets cured and spreads. I also learned that um, people go blind there from diseases that I'd never heard of before. There are these whole sets of tropical diseases called neglected tropical diseases that lead to blindness. One of them leads to blindness through a pretty disfiguring and painful process. I also learned something that maybe a lot of you watching know, um, but I didn't know when I was there back in 2000, that there are still places that care for people with leprosy in the world. And not only did I learn that, but I learned that I was afraid to go to those places, that I was worried about interacting with people who had leprosy. And so I learned that I was someone who was willing to treat other people as if they were different than me, that they were unapproachable, and that I was afraid of them. And so I learned about stigma firsthand. But I also learned that when I came back to the United States, I was thankful and I was joyful for all the incredible things that we have here. But also, I was really filled with hope because I really, really believed that all these things we have here, these wonderful, uplifting things that allow our children to go to school and be healthy, they're things that exist because people are powerful. We can do things. We can change the world and make the world a better place if we just know what it is that needs to be changed. If we know what needs to be fixed, we can fix it. And so that gives me a lot of hope. And so I thought back to my liberal arts education, and that's how I ended up at DePaul. Because liberal arts students, to me, are the people who can fix these problems. They're the people who take all these different classes, right? They take ethics to think about what needs to be done in the world, and they take biostatistics to study what's going on. And they take anthropology to understand how to interact with different cultures. And they learn how to listen, and how to speak, and how to do quantitative reasoning. And so these students are really well adapted to deal with this global health crisis, with the world of global health. So I'm showing this picture because DePaul looks really beautiful there, and it makes me happy because lately it's really looked a lot like this, <laughs> and apparently tomorrow it's going to look like this again. But in any case, our students are ready to fix the problems, right? But they need to know what it is that needs to be fixed. And some of the things that need to be fixed are the things I spoke about in talking about what I would experienced in Uganda. Poverty, and poverty especially that leads to things like malnutrition and to infectious disease problems, and to lack of access to medicines that can fix those diseases, and to stigma that makes people unwilling to help the people who have diseases, and to painful disabilities. So these are the problems that need to be fixed. We've got the people who can fix them, but what do we know about these problems? Do we really know like enough about them to fix them? To really fix a problem, I feel that you need to know details about it. You can't just say like, oh, there's something out there that we have to fix. You have to say, what are the details about it? How do we know where it's happening, when it's happening, who it's happening to, what's going on, how many numbers are there associated with it? So we have to really buckle down to figure out the answer to this problem. So luckily, we're not the only people who are worried about how do you answer the problem about the details of global health. There are other people who have been trying to figure out how to measure health um, wellness in the world and health disabilities in the world and health problems in the world. And one of the most common measures of health in the world is something called the DALI. The DALI stands for Disability Adjusted Life Years. And it's sort of a hard topic, so I'll try to go through it slowly and feel free to ask questions. So we already said that one way to think about health and the lack of health is to say how many years are lost to early death, right? So we saw in that earlier slide that Japan lives longer than anyone else. So we're going to take Japan as the model of how long you should live. And any populations that live less long than that, we're going to say that they have years of life that are lost to premature death. So those are going to contribute to the death. But those aren't the only thing. We also want to figure out how many years people are alive but living suboptimally. So their health is not 100%. Right? This is tricky. Because it's hard to judge how many years of healthy life are actually lost to any given illness. 
So what they do, people do, is take the number of people who have any given condition that we want to talk about. And they say they're going to multiply it by something called the disability factor. And here, disability does not mean disability the way it does in the English normal American language. What it means is anything that lowers your quality of life from perfect health status. So anything, it could be like a runny nose is a disability in this way. And the disability factor can go anywhere from zero to one. So you take the number of people who are living maybe in absolutely perfect health. And those people, you give them a disability factor of zero because there's no disability at all. They're absolutely perfect. So you take that many people, multiply it by zero, and you find out they lost no lives to disability during that year. But then if there are people who are living in the condition that basically makes life almost unbearable for them, it makes it very similar to being dead to them, this disability factor could be like 0.9. It would be one in the extreme place, right? Then you would say that everyone living with that condition for a year, actually it was close to being dead for that year, right? So there's, there might be a condition where you would multiply it by something like 0.9 and you'd say, okay, you were alive, so it's not a full one year, but it was like 90% of that year was lost. So that factor is something that we could talk about a little more if you want, because it's kind of complicated how it um, is derived. And a lot of people have weighed in on this in a lot of different ways over the year. So first I'll tell you a little bit about right now how people are thinking about that disability factor. We could talk about this more if you want. Um, right now, the way we determine the disability factor for the world is we do surveys of all these different populations. We do surveys um, by web, by phone, and by door-to-door -door household surveys in places where people don't have access to phone or web or are illiterate. And people ask, get asked, um, they get presented with two different people with different sets of symptoms, and they say, who do you think is healthier? Not who do you think has a better life, not who do you think is better off, but who do you think is healthier? So it's purely a health question, which is a new thing for the disability factor. It didn't used to be that way. So someone would say, the first person has blah, 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 and the second person has da, 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 who do you think is healthier? And this is what was done for the Global Burden of Disease, GBD 2010. And they did this with 220 unique health states that they found actually will define the universe of non-fatal outcomes. So they said, other than dying, there are 220 different ways that you could feel bad. So here are two of them that you can think about. So this might be one of the surveys that you were given. It said, the first person has diarrhea three or more times a day with severe belly cramps. The person is very thirsty and feels nauseous and tired. The second person has occasional fever <coughs> and infections. The person takes daily medication that sometimes causes diarrhea. So you're given this in layman's terms. So think about what you think, right? You would decide who you think is healthier. Your data would be pooled along with everyone else's data run through algorithms that would help come up with a global disability ranking. The first is severe diarrhea. The second is HIV AIDS cases for people receiving treatment. And the GBD disability factors that the world came up with was about 0.28 for diarrhea and 0.053 for HIV AIDS but with treatment. So that says having HIV AIDS but receiving treatment, people think that your quality of life is 95% as good as not having HIV AIDS, just given this description. So those are the kinds of things that might be occurring in the countries we're talking about where some of the poorest people live. Here are two other things that might be a little closer to something you might see or know here at home. The first person hears and sees things that are not real and is afraid, confused, and sometimes violent. The person has great difficulty with communication and daily activities and sometimes wants to harm or kill himself or herself. The second person has complete memory loss, no longer recognizes close family members, and requires help with all daily activities. So this is schizophrenia in the acute stage and dementia severe. So a lot of us probably know someone with severe dementia in our families. You see schizophrenia is actually ranked as one of the worst disabilities to have. It's considered to be 
one of the most difficult ways to live by the global population on the whole. And in fact, severe dementia is considered worse than either of these two things up here. So you can think about what it means that different people are weighing in on this and what it means to have an average value and disability factor. So these are some of the data that came out of using those disability factors. So you took disability factors and used them to figure out the years of healthy life that were lost, combined those with the years that were lost due to actual death, figured out all those numbers of DALIs, and then ranked them around the world. So these are global rankings. In 1990, compared to 2010, and this is from that global burden of disease analysis in 2010. And I'll tell you that the pink ones, I don't know how great the color looks on your screens at home, hopefully a little better than it looks here. The pink ones are communicable, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional disorders. The blue ones are non-communicable diseases, and green is injury, which would include injury, but also like personal violence against other people. And you can see that in 1990, there was a lot more pink, the communicable and maternal and nutritional disorders, than there is in 2010. So the world actually, and this is one of the conclusions of these studies, the world seems to be moving away from a state of communicable disease being the worst thing you could have, and towards a state of non-communicable disease being the worst thing that could be going on in the world, ranking in the top 10. You can see it used to be the top three disease burdens in the world were communicable disease, and now only one of the top three is. So that's really interesting, and it's informing a lot of what's going on in global health now. Well, let's break that apart. Instead of just looking at global averages, let's look at high-income North America versus eastern sub-Saharan Africa. So that's where Uganda is, the place that I was. High-income North America, everything's blue. It's all non-communicable. These are the things we're dealing with today here. Here's Eastern Sub-Saharan Africa, everything's red. It's all still communicable. So if we only look at those global averages, we would say, like, we don't even need to worry about these things anymore. We'll just stop caring. But then you look at certain parts of the world, these are the things that are causing disease burden, that are harming people. So we still need to keep these things in mind. So this is what and how we look at health. We uh, look at health using the DALI and the global burden of disease. And we do it through this kind of complicated analysis of all the people in the world, weighing into what they think matters, and then all these computer algorithms and people crunching numbers. But why should we study this? I can think of three reasons. I'm sure you can think of others. One reason that I can think of studying this is say, if I can tell you about where people are healthy and not healthy, then I can focus in on those healthy people and see what are they doing correct. What are they doing that I can take and transfer to someone else? <laughs> if I can see where people are really, really unhealthy, then I can say, I should be helping people in this region. If I can see what makes people unhealthy, not just in one region, but all over the world, then I can say, I need to focus on this disease, not just this region, but this disease. So knowledge of the global burden of disease has, in fact, informed those types of things. It's informed policy, health interventions, and research into what can prevent future health emergencies. Who should do this work? How's it financed? Who are the players? There is an enormous amount of money and an enormous number of players in this field. So WHO is the first and kind of head player. WHO was created um, in the late 1940s from a previous rendition that existed under the League of Nations. And it's a branch of the UN. So you can imagine, as such, it has some trouble sometimes implementing things. We'll just leave that at that. The Global Fund for the Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria is something that's kind of arisen up out of this problem with WHO. And what the Global Fund really sees itself as, I should say the Global Fund started being talked about around the time of the G8 summit in 2000. So the Global Fund is really kind of a conduit for money takes money from rich countries, from anyone who wants to give it money, from corporations, from foundations, from nonprofits, and it channels it to countries to deal with their own problems in the way they want to. They have to write grants that say how they're going to attack these problems. The Gates Foundation is one of the biggest players in public health. Gates has given more money to global health 
than some nations have. <coughs> Partners in Health started off as a tiny nonprofit operating out of Boston that dealt with health problems in Haiti. <clears throat> it's now um, influences global health policy at the level of WHO. The Carter Center I, is very dear to me. I just think it's a wonderful place. It's in Atlanta, so I knew about it back when I was at the Centers for Disease Control. But also, um, this was started by President Jimmy Carter. Um, it also deals particularly with neglected tropical diseases. So the diseases of people who we really tend not to think about otherwise, and diseases that we don't really pay a lot of attention to. And in fact, the Carter Center is one of the people making the most progress on that um, blindness disease I told you about, river blindness. And there's also a host of other grassroots organizations. So this is, this is a huge number of players here and a lot of money. So that also gives me hope. There are people who care about this. And they're already working at it. And there are like a lot of IQ points here. So it seems like we're probably going to make some progress, right? But who else should do this work? These are multidisciplinary questions. Like I said before, right? It takes every discipline you've ever taken a class in here into pop to help answer these questions. And it takes people at all different levels of their career to help with these questions. And part of the reason it's multidisciplinary, uh, no, let me say it this way. I want to show you how it's multidisciplinary. So this is GapBinder data again. And on the vertical axis is infant mortality. And infant mortality is always given in the rate per 1,000 births. So it's different than a percent. It's rate per 1,000 births. And on the horizontal axis is GDP per capita. And this plot is actually a little bit different to look at than maybe what you're used to because it's got the log scale on both axes. That means that the numbers, as you go up, like if you started on the vertical axis in the bottom left, the numbers aren't just going to go up in a, a linear fashion. As you move up, they'll kind of become compressed. So all that means is some of these data are actually even more dramatically different than it looks like on this plot. So again, all of these points on this plot represent different countries. And again, I highlighted three countries for us to look at. And I again picked the United States because of our own interest. I picked Uganda because of my interest. And then here I picked Belarus, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So here we can see again that economy and health are interrelated, right? Multidisciplinary. We've got economics and health. And if you look at these trends, it looks like infant mortality rates go down as the GDP per, P per capita goes up. So for a long time, these data were interpreted to say that we should be pouring money into countries. And if we can help the economy get started, then people will be able to take care of people in their countries and infant mortality will go down. And then in the 90s, a whole bunch of ec economists started doing all these studies and they realized it wasn't that straightforward. Maybe it's flipped, but it's at least back and forth. It's actually that if you can get infant mortality to decrease, GDP goes up. And then it plays back and forth in a circle. So you don't anymore want to just say, let's dump money in. We'll say, let's give money for targeting health concerns. And that will help our world's economy. Oh, let me go back and tell you about Belarus. The reason I put Belarus here is to highlight for you, it's very easy when you're talking about global health to think about it not being a problem for the United States. So remember, there's a log scale, so differences are a little bigger than they look. And right here is the United States. We're pretty rich. And we have a decent infant mortality, it looks like, like six per thousand live births. Look at Belarus. They're not nearly as rich as we are. And they're just like killing us in infant mortality. Right? The United States is not good in infant mortality. We're ranked around 50th in infant mortality in the world. It's like embarrassing. And in fact, if you looked at individual communities within the United States, you would see an even worse um, infant mortality rate. So I guess I shouldn't just say it's embarrassing. I should also say, really, the reason I really care about this is it helps us to recognize that we shouldn't just say the problem's all of them. Right? Or like, we're great and we should just model everything for other people. We also are part of this. We're part of global health. All right, so here is another one of these plots. Here we have. Um, Child mortality, zero to five year olds per 1,000 births, versus the mean years in school for women of reproductive age 15 to 40. Again, Uganda, United States, Belarus, I added in Singapore. I think I added it in because it was so low on this axis of child mortality, so I thought it was an interesting one to highlight there. 
And again, you can see these trends go down. But again, remember, it's not going to just be that as people get more, or as child mortality goes down, people go to school more. It's also as people go to school more, child mortality goes down. And health and education are so intricately linked, right? You get better educated, you can get a better job. You get a better job, you can afford to feed your family. But if you're sick, you can't go to school. And then you can't get the job. And then you can't afford to feed your family. And then the next generation gets sick and they don't go to school. So I talked about health and wealth and education being linked. Let's think about this, health and safety. So all of these things interplay with each other. There should be an arrow down the middle, too, saying health and safety are interrelated. So back when I was at the, um, in, in Uganda in 2000, and I knew this little boy. His name was Stephen. And Stephen was 11 years old. And right now my older son is 11 years old. So I think this hits home for me even more now, although it was tragic even then. Stephen told me one day that, um, that he was scared at night, that he was scared that there'd be a knock on his door, and that it would be the large resistance army, and that they would take him and forcibly make him part of their rebel group. And um, because of that, the hospital I worked at, Latour Hospital, every night they would open their gates, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people would come in and sleep in the gates of this hospital at night. Up to 12,000 people would sleep, just lined up wall to wall, all around this hospital and all through the courtyard because it was safe there. And so that taught me that health and safety are related. But health isn't just about taking care of people, it's also about making people safe. And it's making people safe so that they can sleep. It's making parents safe so they can get their harvest for their kids to have nutrition. It's making you safe enough that you can go find a bathroom to use or that you can get drinkable water. So these two things are really related too. So, Right now, literally as we're sitting here, there are children in the world who are dying of preventable diseases. And literally right now, we could guarantee that there's a woman somewhere giving birth on the side of a dirt road. While she tried to get to a health clinic, maybe but she couldn't get there. And right now somewhere, there's a man who's going to work and he'll be exposed to a tropical disease, to some parasite that will cause him to become disfigured or in some way unable to contribute as well to his family to enjoy his life. So to me, that's a crisis. That's a global health crisis. It's saying that there is difficulty in the world. And the difficulty is a kind of difficulty that everybody would recognize as difficult if we all saw it. If we all looked at the numbers, and if we all thought about it, we would all say it was a crisis. We would all say that someone has to respond. We would all say that action has to be taken. And there are a lot of people out there who are already taking action, right? All those charts going up and down, things are looking better. So I honestly am filled with a lot of hope. I'm honestly happy that people want to come to a global health talk. I think the students at DePaul right now are really honestly going to make these changes for us. And so I'm really filled with hope for our future, as long as we can all kind of share the stories and tell other people about what the problems are and what needs fixing. So I thank you for your interest in this subject because I think it's really important to have people who care. I've given you my email if you want to be in touch. And then I also gave you the kind of logo taglines from all these different um, organizations that I referred to during the evening. And also to DePaul, where we're working hard to build up the academics that we have in global health. So thank you for listening and I'll take questions from Steve from you okay. now. We would uh, welcome questions at this time, both from our online audience as well as anyone here who's live in the room. So, welcome questions at this point. I want to start off by telling us a little bit more about some of your ongoing work in Africa. You shared a few anecdotes there, yeah, totally. Stephen and others, but we'd love to know more about some of your boots on the ground work Thanks uh, for in asking. Africa. Yeah. Um, so I've been back there a couple times since the first time I went. Um, I went back that summer with my husband. Um, and actually we were going to move there. We had it all set up to move there and then I got pregnant. So then I didn't go back there for a number of years and I started going back in 2008 so that I could start teaching students here about um, global health and some students who um, are here one student in the audience 
has been to northern Uganda to this area on her own. Um, some alums have gone there. And I still work with Latour Hospital really closely. And I also work with an um, orphanage in the area that's, that also focuses on, they have schooling. And it has a, um, a home for children with disabilities, which I think is actually one of the places where the future of that orphanage is going. Um, children that are living with disabilities in places with extreme poverty is probably one of the saddest things I've ever seen. They're the people who have the least number of resources. And so that's somewhere where I feel really passionate about trying to push forward. Um, it's also somewhere I don't have a lot of experience. I don't know a lot about disabilities. So I'm sort of in the same boat we all are, where we just have to sit down and learn and read things and become better at doing that. We have a uh, question online from Sarah Hampel. Hi, Sarah. Who asks, what are your favorite publications or sources for staying updated on public health issues? Mm. Broad topic, I know. Any you browse most frequently? All right. I'd be curious to know what you read. Um, all this global burden of disease stuff is in the Lancet. So I think that's actually a good place. Um, I think all the public library of science journals I really enjoy reading because I really like to know about the molecular mechanisms behind things as well. And generally, in the public library of science journals, like particularly the neglected tropical disease ones, will also be editorials that talk to you about what the most current problems are and why research dollars are being directed to that. Um, I mean, Journal of Tropical Medicine and things like that are good to read as well. Do you have ones that you particularly read, Sarah? Can she type back in to answer me? She could. We'll see how fast of a typer she All is. All right. Maybe we'll come back to you. Do you want to think it's particularly fabulous? I also just, I spend a lot of time um, trying to just kind of keep my eye on what's really, what, what people are talking about in public health now. So I look a lot at like what's on the WHO website, what's on the Centers for Disease Control website. Um, I think about what the Gates Agency, Gates Foundation is doing because they're driving global health right now. So if you don't know what they want to do, you don't know what's going to be done. Um, so I think that's important. Um, Emerging Infectious Disease Journal and Morbidity and Mortality Reports from the Centers for Disease Control are important. There's one where I, I think that maybe, did, did Nancy Burkett log in tonight? Um, let me check here. I don't think she, okay. oh yeah, she is, she is. All right. yeah. So she emailed me earlier today and I just want to like say this, I don't, I guess she can't like speak, but she sent me these pictures of smallpox cases that she had seen in, I think, 1971. Maybe she can type if I'm wrong or how she saw them. But to me, that's insane. That's amazing. And so next time she's on campus, because she's an alum, you should meet her. And her husband is an alum, too, yes. You should meet them both and hear the stories about smallpox. Because that's one of the things that is often, you know, in the news about, like, maybe there'll be a bioterrorist event someday with smallpox. And we won't even realize it's smallpox, because none of us have even seen it. And our doctors today won't have even seen it. So when they're here, you should talk to them about how they knew it was smallpox, how people knew it first, how scary it was, how they reacted, what they had to do. You should learn from people who did it, especially if you're going into medical school. I don't know if she would say the same thing. I assume so. That, that I think is a tremendous opportunity. Tell us more about your research with Ebola. I mean, okay. one of the most frightening diseases, I think. I mean, at least from my yes, perspective, um, which is working not... with Ebola virus is um, always a conversation stopper. Absolutely. Um, people, you know, are like, what do you do? And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm a journalist. And I'm an event coordinator. I'm like, I work with Ebola. And people take like a step back. Um, but it's actually here at DePaul, we work with Ebola virus, like only little bits and pieces of it. So there's nothing dangerous that we're working with. Um, we all, I've had to talk to parents on the phone about the student research in my lab and how safe they'll be. Um, we just work with little pieces of RNA and little pieces of protein and how they interact to make a disease state. When I was at the Centers for Disease Control, I did um, work with um, live virus, and that was why I was in that kind of silly suit for that picture, to protect us from that. But I never felt afraid of that. So I've told other people this. The thing I was afraid about in going to Uganda was the size of the spiders there. I wasn't worried about it. Maybe that was foolish of me. <laughs> Questions here in the room? We want to shortchange our students here. It turned out on a beautiful uh, evening here on campus. Yes? Um, when you were working with Ebola and, and like, in Uganda with the 
CDC, how did like the lab laboratory conditions differ from what you would get yeah. here, and how did you kind of work with those differences to such like a dangerous pathogen? Yeah, it's really interesting how easily you adapt to the difference in conditions, because at the CDC in Atlanta, we're obviously as cautious as you could possibly be. You're working under like negative pressure in the suit, and everything has the most safety you could possibly have. But there, obviously, um, we didn't have those conditions. But actually, Latour Hospital had labs, and the labs had hoods. And so we were, we were pretty fortunate to have pretty good conditions. The windows were open, and so it was a little different from a sealed room. Um, and we didn't have, like at the CDC, you go in and out of a shower room that you get like Lysol decons on in your suit. Um, and then you change in and out of your street clothes so that you don't carry any virus with you under any conditions and you take an actual shower. There we would just step through a vat of Lysol, like a big cooler full of Lysol, to make sure that we decomp our feet and then spray ourselves down in Lysol on the, the um, upper. But it's really, it's safe. It's, I mean, everything's great. No researcher or doctor from a Western country has gotten sick with Ebola during an outbreak. I mean, I think it's because we're really good at, you know, the technique that needs to be used. We're used to wearing gloves and masks. So it's unfortunate that Ebola virus really does take a toll on local healthcare populations. It's absolutely devastating. It was the worst thing to see in this hospital. Um, but but it's, not, it's not an airborne virus. Okay. We have a few questions coming in. This is from Sarah Hughes. Dr. Creary, I was wondering if you could expand upon the global burden of disease metrics ranking. Could you further elaborate on this specifically? If it aims to serve as a global ranking, how do they take into consideration different perspectives of health? How they consider what is a life well lived, etc. Also, have you seen if and how this has impacted other econometrics fields such as cost benefit analysis, etc.? Okay, that's such a great question, Sarah. I should expect that from you. Oh. <laughs> I hope you're doing well, by the way. I don't know how many years it was ago that you graduated, but it's great you're here. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, the people who did that particular GBD analysis are adamant that they showed that no matter how you do the statistics and how you run the kind of covariation analysis, that different populations around the world gave the same um, disability rank factor for each of the disabilities that was analyzed. So actually, like people in the United States and people in India both felt that if you said person A and person B, they both chose it equally. Um, there was, I think, data from Bangladesh is, is more skewed. There's more variation in the data from Bangladesh. It's not as clear of a correlation between what people there think and what people here think. Um, the other thing that's not really taken into account, I guess, is what it might mean to have these different symptoms all at once. Like a lot of the neglected tropical diseases cause you to have all these symptoms at once. And there's something about that that must be extraordinarily demoralizing, right? That each of them in and of itself isn't really all that bad, but if you listed all the symptoms at once and asked someone to rank how that felt, you might say like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can take it. Right? Even though like they're all just kind of mild symptoms. And then in terms of like, I think you asked about like cost-benefit analysis. Yeah, so cost-effectiveness is usually the term that's used in global health, but I guess it's the same kind of thing. You're saying we have a limited amount of money to spend, and we're going to spend it on some health intervention. What are we going to spend it on? And that's what um, a lot of people criticize the GBD for saying that they're claiming that's what we should do. GBD says they're not doing that. They're just statistics people and that all they're actually doing is listing the rankings for you, and then someone else can decide how the money should be spent. So they're careful to say that they actually want other people to say, well, even though this is the worst, the, the highest number of disabilities in the world, it actually might not be the thing we should focus on. Because for instance, you could say, just because more people have this, doesn't mean we should focus on it. It could be like, okay, more people have itchy skin, but are we gonna spend all our money on that when like three children died? You know, like a lot of people have itchy skin, so a GBD, it seems really bad, but three children died. So GBD is just saying, all we're saying is like a lot of people have itchy skin, we're not saying you have to treat them. But of course, the data doesn't get used for that, so it's a little controversial. So I hope that answered your question, Sarah. Sarah's actually written back in saying, I am doing well. Thank you again for <laughs> such a uh, wonderful people-centered talk. Oh. 
There you go. Couple questions. Let's go to the other side of the room here. If you could try to speak up so the mic will pick your voice up here. I guess uh, my question is sort of related to the last. Uh, just, I know there's a lot of critiques of the DALI system. Like some people would argue that you just like, can't quantify health. Uh, so I'm curious what your interpretation is of like the value of the DALI system um, and whether or not maybe there are alternatives or just like the best we had, even though we may have yeah. one, but it's just like the best we can sort of do. Okay. So the question was. Um, sort of recognizing that the DALI system is imperfect and maybe asking for my opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and saying what other systems are out there as well, right? Okay. So yeah, the DALI system is imperfect. And I guess what's nice about it now, when it first came out, it was like revolutionary. And so it was a great amount of work that was done for the first one in like 1990. But people just like tore it apart for some of the things that were seen as unethical about it. But it was the first time it was done at all, and the authors actually responded extraordinarily well to all the feedback they got, and pretty much addressed every concern that was brought forward about how the original disability rankings were done. Um, so I do think it's better than it was, which gives me hope that it will keep getting better, right? Um, maybe it's not perfect yet, but it does seem to be, it seems to be like maybe the most interesting system we have to date for looking at global levels. But I guess one of the things I don't like is that it's really made the conversation about global health focus on non-communicable disease. And maybe it's true that if we think about all those trends, maybe it means that within 10 years, everyone in the world will be only worried about non-communicable disease. But I feel like if you focus down on populations, and what if we didn't just look at like Sub-Saharan Africa, but we looked at Uganda. We didn't just look at Uganda, but we looked at Kampala versus Gulu. There's going to be huge differences there. So I guess that's one of the things that really worries me is this kind of overgeneralization about what it means. And then also I tend to be the kind of person, I mean, I have you know, multiple flaws, but one of them is that I tend to be like extraordinarily idealistic and I'm convinced that we can just come up with the money to do all of it. And so in that case, I feel like we don't need to do this GBD ranking. We should all just be out there like fixing all these problems. And if we were all doing it, we wouldn't need all these rankings because we'd all just be doing it and it would all be taken. Um, so yeah, I am a little bit more of a person who thinks like we should just work small on location and fix the problems. But I do recognize the need for a global approach as well. It's tricky. Tess, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, my question was, how would you encourage people from multidisciplinary areas of interest who do have an interest in global health to get involved? You're obviously really hands-on with your yeah. not-for-profit in Uganda, but how would you encourage students in the room who don't have that experience, yeah. or even, I guess, your love online to really get involved right. in this topic. Okay, okay, so the question was, um, let's say you come into this with this background, you're liberal arts, you're multidisciplinary, how can you get involved? You're interested and you really want to do something. I think, so there's a lot of things. One is just start reading. Read, 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 read. Like, go online and spend a lot of money on books. Or go to your library and ask them to interlibrary loan them for you. And just, like, read nonstop. Like, I have a stack of global health books next to my bed, and I read them every night. Um, I think that's important, but I understand what you're saying is when I'm not reading my enzyme genetics books. <laughs> when, I think what you're asking is more like, what can you do, right? So there's one site that I liked early on, which was called idealist.org, like idealist or idealist.org. And they list um, like all these different nonprofit opportunities around the country at all different levels, like volunteer level, distance level. And you could even um, find opportunities where maybe you could help someone do grant writing. Or there are a lot of nonprofits that would be like dying for you to do really grunt work kind of things, like help write their thank you notes and things like that. I mean, one of the things I've learned from running a nonprofit is like a lot of it isn't really all that glamorous. Um, and so I think recognizing that and being willing to do that. But if what you're saying is like, how can I start doing stuff now so that I can like make a difference someday? I would say if you're here at DePaul, you should do an extended studies to a different location, right? You've done that. And um, the more you can do that, better. If you're an alum, I think we're hoping to someday have those for you too, so that you can come back and go on trips with us. And that would be awesome if our students and our alums could be interacting on those trips and our students could be learning from you and vice versa. That would be just beautiful, I think. And then maybe those people could get together and say, well, I want to continue to work in this area. I want to continue to work in Ecuador and think about how I can change things there. So I'm going to learn all the disability factors in that area. I'm going to learn everything about the health there. I'm going to learn everything I can learn about the policy there so that I can really make a difference. But I think the more you can see, probably the better off you are, and the more people you can talk to. It's hard until you really, I think, 
I think you'll know, guys. I think you'll know when like you found the one thing you're gonna do. And you'll be like, all right, this is it. Now I'm focusing in. And until then, just keep learning as much as you can everywhere you go, I would say. Which I know isn't like a terribly satisfying answer. I'm like, do this tomorrow. <laughs> Dr. Curry, there's another conversation going on on campus right now about climate. Oh yes, there is. And um, you you mentioned you're an idealist. Mm -hmm. a, a cold realist might look at climate change and some of our eco ecological challenges and say, you know, the biggest factor in that is the extraordinary hockey stick shape growth of population right. and the advances in agriculture and in health mm -hmm. have made that happen. Sure. What do you say to that cold realist? Yeah, who, well I think the, the, did everyone hear the question? I think probably. Um, the question was what do I, like right now on campus there's a different question, a different conversation going on in a different room about global climate change. And what would I say to like a cold realist who says like the problem is you, Sharon Ferry, <laughs> wanting there to be people who are healthier and live longer because then the population is growing and we have all these problems, right? So I would say if you look, I I, I think actually that question, I could probably I hope deflect pretty easily that if you look at countries as um, life expectancy goes up and the economy gets better, people have fewer children. That's just true across the board, that actually populations decrease as economies get wealthier. Um, so if you look at like the United States, um, there's, we have fewer children per mother than Uganda has. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, probably one of them is empowerment of women and women knowing about health and about healthy spacing of children. Um, probably another one is a lack of need to have as many children when you realize that they're all gonna live. If 50% of your kids are going to live, maybe you have more kids. Um, so, but the other thing about climate change that's interesting, and so where I really, um, I mean, I obviously care about climate change, um, but it's going to affect us here in the United States in terms of global health. Because all of these neglected tropical diseases that have not been in our country for a long time, they were here a long time ago, but we got rid of them. They are starting to come back. So we're starting to see uh, malaria in our country and Chagas disease, and we'll see more and more of these as especially the southern part of our country warms up more. And not just warming, right, but change of climate. So we will start seeing, and we already are seeing, differences in um, health problems in our own country. We've got a couple good questions online here. The first from Jennifer Behrens. Hi. Hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, hi, Sharon. Thanks for a great talk. One of the things I don't recall you saying from previous conversations was, I was scared. What things have moved you from being afraid of people with leprosy and other ailments to being not only comfortable with them, but proactive in their care? Essentially, how did you get over it? Well, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, part of, honestly, part of how I got over it was by living there for a while. So I was really scared. At first, I thought of really silly things, right? But I, to me, they were real things. Like, what have I ever had to worry about other than the giant spiders, right? So that was what I was worried about going there. That was the thing I couldn't control. And then, you know, after like, like a cockroach being poured out of my water bottle at the dinner table or like boring nights where we would like bet on which cockroach would make it up to the top of the ceiling first on the wall. Um, they weren't as afraid. I was just wasn't as afraid anymore. So I honestly think just exposure, right? Anything new is scary always. And um, some things I was afraid of because they were new and different. Um, some things I think I was afraid of in retrospect, because at the time, like, you're all caught up in it and you don't really realize, like, that hut I was in, I don't think I necessarily realized I was scared at the time where I wasn't processing it as much, and then later, and especially after I had children, I definitely worried more. I think probably most of the people online who have children would agree that, like, all of you people who are young before you have kids should do things like this, because, um, you know, you have different obligations once you have children. And a lot of people juggle all those obligations beautifully. For me, it was a little bit harder. I had to wait till my children were a little older before I was willing to jump back in and take some of those risks again. Um, but yeah, I think recognizing that there are bigger problems in the world than the spiders I was worried about and the cockroaches. I think recognizing that like kids being sick is a bigger deal than me like touching a cockroach. That helped me. Our next question is actually uh, from Uganda. 
Is that Sejal? Sejal Tremblay. Hi, Sejal. Right. Uh, who writes, she's had interactions with people who don't see modern medicine as necessary or only seek it when the disease has progressed very far and is nearly untreatable. Do you know of any successful projects that help change these attitudes? I don't think I do, Sage, on that top of my head. I have to think. I feel like you have had more... Okay, so Latour Hospital would be like a big scale, so to me that's not going to help you, right? It's not going to help you in your day-to-day, -day, like trying to get people in there right now. But what I saw and what I've heard and understand about Latour is it started as a little like missionary clinic, and people didn't want to go there. And over 30 years of consistently offering good care and people consistently going home to their villages and telling people that they got cured, people just flood in now, right? There's lines of people who want to go to the doctor. Just like anything else and any people anywhere, we're not going to waste our time in line somewhere for something that's not going to work. But if your friend tells you, like, no, I tried this, you should totally try it. Like, you've had that headache for a week, you have to go see this doctor, he's great. That helps. So it's a little bit maybe patience is the only thing I've seen. I haven't seen any, like, you know, randomized control trials on it or anything that I can tell you about. But now I'm going to look into it. So, uh, yeah, I'll let you know when I hear about it. And you can tell me if you've read about it. All right. Any last questions? I think with that, we'll thank Dr. Crary and close thank tonight's uh, virtual alumni college. I would remind all of our uh, alumni online that we'll have another session uh, next Monday, March 17th, on Putin's Crimean caper, the best defense, a quick offense, with Dr. Ralph Raymond, Professor Emeritus of Political Science. So hope to see you then. Thank you. Thank you.